Um, I don't want to take up the floor with too many announcements. It's already there on our website, uh, marksedproject.org. Uh, we, we're going to hear from Peter now, who will speak for 25 to 40 minutes. Uh, there's so much in the book, so many things to be concerned with. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to both hearing from Peter and our discussion. And Peter, the Zoom room floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And thanks to all the, the folks who showed up and also the folks who, who uh, have kept this forum going in one form or another for, for so many decades. It's, it's really valuable to have, to have spaces like this. Uh, so my book, uh, The Solutions Are Already Here, Strategies for Ecological Revolution from Below, uh, to, to simplify, I can divide it into three parts. It has five distinct chapters, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, I'll talk about like the three, the three main, um, main thrusts or the main areas that it explores. The first uh, consists of criticisms of mainstream responses to the ecological crisis. Uh, first of all, the very way that it's talked about and defined. Uh, ecological crisis is not a, a framework that's used uh, that often. Much more often we hear about climate change. And then within climate change, we hear about uh, carbon emissions. So it's a much more technocratic approach to the problem that, uh, that really weeds out a lot of the factors that are all wrapped together in, you know, what's happening that's threatening, um, you know, that's uh, threatening, uh, life on this planet that's that's causing like a huge amount of uh of suffering and and death and impoverishment and immiseration already uh that's causing extinctions um at 10,000 times uh the like the background historical rate uh, that's causing the loss of a, of a lot of ecosystems a lot of ways of life destruction of the commons uh and and so there's so many factors that are wrapped up in that ecological crisis and carbon emissions are definitely a part of that, and climate change is a major part of that, but it's not the only thing. And as we see in a lot of specific cases, uh, when you have a more robust ecosystem, then it's more able to adapt to and, and to survive uh, climate change or even to, um, uh, to, to, to moderate climate change. It's, it's more able to absorb uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases. So uh, it really only makes sense to have that reductionist technocratic view from the standpoint of these technocratic institutions that have access to, I mean, you know, you and I in our, in our living rooms, we probably don't have the materials, uh, the equipment that we need to, to uh, measure, you know, parts per million carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere. But, uh, you know, people, social formations that do exist in a relationship with, with the commons, with their ecosystem, we are able to notice changes and, and to measure changes that are happening to our surroundings that are happening uh, to the land, to the weather and so forth. They're just not in these, in these um, technocratic ways. So it's, it's an approach that from the very beginning uh, disempowers popular action and community action around these problems or even understanding of these problems and, and puts us in this, this very passive role of waiting for the information that's, that's coming from the experts. And there, I mean, there is a place for that information. Of course, there is, there is a place for um, scientifically produced information in all of this, but the, the way that the information is packaged and the kinds of information that are deemed legitimate or not legitimate are already going to be predetermining uh, who, who can be active in, in responding to the problem, what institutional framework the problem is going to be responded to um, within and, and all that. Another thing that I kind of alluded to already is that it's often talked about in the media as a future problem when it is very much an ongoing problem. Uh, it's a problem that, you know, especially if we take this broader uh, um, ecological look and, is, and even more so if we, if we put it within an anti-colonial framework, which I think we, we have to do, it's a problem that's been that we can see, um, you know, the, the, the signs of going back hundreds of years. And when we sort of just, you know, look at it on the television or within the framework of the IPCC or, you know, the, the United Nations um, format, then they talk about, you know, we have five years left, we have three years left, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, who, who has that amount of time left? Because it's not the, you know, the tens of millions of people who are already dying every year because of famine, because of drought, because of floods and other extreme weather events. Uh, you know, that, like they, they don't have that time left. Like they've, they've already died. They're species that have already gone extinct. They don't have that time left. Um, 
so I think it's very important to, to put it in a framework of understanding that this is something that's already ongoing, that has very deep historical roots uh, connected to capitalism, connected to the state, connected to, uh, to patriarchy, um, and to the, the process of colonization that, that globalized all of those, um, all of those forces. And it's, it's a problem that we're all impacted by and that we uh, all should be responding to, but we're trained and, and, you know, essentially we're also packaged in a way that we just have to um, passively take, you know, whatever meager tools that they give us, which are largely related to, you know, ethical, ethical consumerism, uh, green capitalism, uh, you know, voting for one political party or another when there's a very small amount of difference in, in the sort of, um, proposals that they're that they're willing to consider so um so much of of the official institutional solutions to the problem are really just reflections of the problem and in a lot of ways they're they're uh, strategies to further the problem and to reproduce the problem so green capitalism for example is is great for making money it's great for increasing uh you know surveillance and social control over a territory uh, it's it's great for creating you know more effective um, forms of of uh, energy production for a capitalist economy. It's not that effective for actually uh, mitigating or or stopping the ecological crisis. So right now across the world, uh, the production of green energy, the production of renewable renewable energy, is one of the great drivers of habitat destruction, of immiseration of human communities. And, and all these other interconnected problems that, um, that we're talking about. So, so there's a great need to, to criticize green capitalism and to criticize the way that the official institutions, even though they are, um, you know, contrary to like the right-wing paranoias about climate change being some big old hoax, scientific institutions are, you know, they are spreading information that is, that is um, very precise. But in fact, they've been largely conservative in their estimates uh, regarding global warming. And also there is, there is an operation going on there when you reduce a very multifaceted uh, problem to, to the much more simplified problem of global warming. So the first two chapters, chapters of the book uh, primarily look at, at those mainstream ways of limiting how we understand the problem and suggest other theoretical frameworks uh, for looking at the problem. For example, frameworks coming from anti-colonial struggles, uh, frameworks that look at um, counterinsurgency and, and social control. So sort of like social war theory, drawing, uh, you know, on the one hand from, you know, thinkers as, as diverse as Franz Fanon or Alfredo Bonanno to, you know, the, like the counterinsurgency experts that the state uh, that various states have have relied on to increase their strategies for maintaining control in the face of conflict and crisis, uh, you know whether that was the British in Kenya, uh, the French in Algeria and Vietnam, the U.S. in Vietnam, and and how in fact so there I mean there's this common idea that governments haven't been taking climate change seriously, and there's validity to, validity to that idea, but that also is an incredibly charitable view that leaves out a huge part of the story. Uh, the U.S. government began taking uh, climate change seriously on certain levels already in the 1960s. Already in the 1960s, you have U.S. government administrations looking at the problem and saying, this is a big problem and we need to take it seriously. And we're not just talking about, you know, the Department of the Interior. Uh, we're talking about the Pentagon. We're talking about how from the beginning they've looked at it as a security problem and seen the, necess the necessity to, to take it very seriously on that level. Um, it, European governments, you know, NATO, NATO aligned governments going back to the, the you know, early part of this century have talked about how they need to uh, further militarize the borders because of the ecological crisis and even use that crisis to normalize, um, uh, normalize the use of the militaries in domestic urban operations by 2020. So that was something that, that NATO governments in Europe were already talking about, um, you know, roughly 20 years ago. And you saw, for example, uh, Italy was, was you know, particularly uh, eager to, to um, uh, deploy this change. So in the face of, uh, you know, earthquakes or other supposedly natural disasters, they would, you know, normalize the use of, of the military. So they've been taking it seriously for a while, but they see it primarily as a, as a security problem. And so this whole, you know, environmentalist NGO framework, they, they barely... They, you know, they're only just beating to actually look at it as a human problem, uh, but they, they 
tend to reject any kind of, you know, deeper framework that, you know, would uh, look at, you know, how governments, you know, actually do take it seriously and that that's a very bad thing for the rest of us, in fact. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that's the first, uh, first section of the book. The, um, the second part I want to talk about, which is the third chapter, that's uh, the, the biggest chapter in the book. It's sort of the bulk of the book. Um, thanks to a whole lot of support uh, from comrades from all around the world, uh, I was able to conduct interviews with, uh, with struggles, with people who have participated in struggles uh, from Brazil to France to Indonesia. And, and that for me is really the, um, the most promising thing going on right now is that there are a lot of movements that have managed to take on and defeat concrete instances of this sort of socioeconomic machine that is, that's the driver of the ecological crisis. So for example, major airport, a major airport being defeated in France or, or mining projects being, being halted in Germany, uh, mining and logging, logging projects being, being stopped in Brazil. Um, I was able to, uh, to do an interview with, uh, with some anarchist comrades who have a, a shared project with Guarani communities in Brazil. Uh, and their, their lands, their traditional lands, were some of the first to be, to be conquered, to be invaded and, and occupied by, in this case, by the Portuguese. And so their lands have been uh, subjected to very ecocidal economic practices that are connected to, um, you know, to, to, to colonial capitalism for hundreds of years. And so it's, it's not a story of, you know, groups of people, you know, defending, for example, you know, rainforest that still exists. It's Guarani communities that are recovering their land that, that has been, you know, exploited by plantation economies or by mines for hundreds of years. They're recovering their land and they're engaging in processes to heal that land. Uh, and so that means often a combination of um, practices of food sovereignty or food autonomy with, uh, you know, practices of habitat restoration, like, like reforestation. And food autonomy is really important because that's one of the most important ways that, you know, people on the bottom of social hierarchies, poor people, colonized people, can, um, can sort of reinvigorate the commons and really create direct access to their own means of survival without the need for reliance on wage labor or, or extractive industries so they can feed themselves uh, and then increase their ability for fighting back against capitalism. And when it's in this sort of anti-colonial framework, like when you're recovering their lands, that's, that's hugely important, uh, just on, on all the different levels that we could talk about, but also like specifically with, you know, with an ecological level, it's taking land that, that has just been made infertile by um, capitalist practices, and it's, it's turning land into an ecosystem again, into a carbon sink that can, you know, really uh, mitigate uh, climate change, into uh, habitats for many, many other species, and into habitats for human communities that are organizing themselves in, in anti-capitalist ways. And so there are, um, uh, there are uh, uh, anarchists who, you know, are, are outside of the city who uh, have relationships of solidarity with these, with these Guarani communities, and they help each other uh, you know, acquire resources. You know, each, each group sort of has access to like a different pool of resources. They, they help support each other against state repression or repression, you know, parastate repression coming from the mining companies and the logging companies, for example. And, and so that was one... Um, one of two interviews I did with, with uh, comrades in, in Brazil, the other one with the group uh, Teo dos Povos, which um, is also featured in the book, uh, and just really inspiring examples of you know, people who are using direct action and solidarity to actually reverse some of these trends of extractivist industries and, and bring about the kind of world that would actually be worth living in and that would, that would be possible uh, to live in for, you know, for human communities, for other, other um, you know, natural communities with, with a lot more species. So, so that's one example. Um, I alluded to the, the ZAD, the, the zone to defend in, in France, which blocked a, a major airport uh, project. And so this was a really um, broad coalition between anti-capitalists of various stripes, local farmers, environmentalists, and they were able to, um, to, to stop a major airport from being constructed. And in the process, they inspired dozens of other ZADs that popped up around mostly French speaking areas. So um, uh, France and, and Switzerland, for example, uh, some of which also uh, stopped uh, you know, infrastructural uh, extractivist projects. And, and that's really important. Um, one thing I wanna say within the interviews for the book, 
uh, I am trying to like create a sense of, you know, that, you know, there is hope, there is reason for hope, at least there are, there are um, battles that are being won. Uh, and I want to sort of, you know, point the way towards, um, you know, imagining what that were look, what that would look like on, on a larger scale. But I also didn't want to paint an exclusively rosy picture with these interviews. So a lot of the interviews talk about repression uh, that these communities face. Um, for example, one of the comrades in Indonesia who helped out with interviews there about um, about Dayak communities uh, fighting back against palm oil plantations in, in, in Borneo. One of the people who helped out with that actually got arrested after the interview took place. And so, you know, some of the, the work around the book has also been just trying to do support for people in prison. Um, and, and, you know, so that's, that's a very real part of this, this problem and these struggles is that, you know, they, they are impacted by repression. You know, there are people who are killed or, or jailed in the course of these struggles. And sometimes some of these struggles are going to get shut down by, by state repression. And it's significant that the environmental NGOs are the mainstream part of the environmental movement and Extinction Rebellion and groups like that typically say nothing about or very little about that repression except in a few media friendly cases where you have, you know, organizations that are involved in peaceful protest and then they, you know, railroaded and, um, and imprisoned or killed. But anytime that you have communities actually fighting back in defense of their collective survival, then most of these mainstream environmental groups are in a way complicit with, um, with that repression and they, they, they remain silent on it. So, um, so I don't try to present a rosy picture and that also means Question what victory means. So if you can cancel an infrastructure project, that's great. But if you do that in a way that in the end you're, um, you're coming to some kind of uh, agreement with the state or with the dominant economic powers and you're, you're taking, you know, a, a, um, uh, like an incremental victory or an institutional victory where, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of mega project gets canceled but in exchange for that, you're, you're basically, you know, giving up the autonomy of a movement or ending like a land occupation that was maybe, gener you know, really, really generative of new social relations, new ideas of, um, of, of how to exist, you know, in relation, you know, with, uh, with other species in relation with the land in relation with one another. Then, then I think it's worth questioning, you know, was that worth it and to what extent that was a victory? Because what we really need are you know, practice, uh, you know, working practices of um, thriving commons, of communal horizontal relations, uh, you know, with, with the land, with other species and, and within human communities. Um, so, yeah, so there's a bunch of interviews in the book from, from North America, from Europe, from, uh, from South America, Asia, uh, and in addition to that, uh, a lot of research uh, where I couldn't, wasn't able to like, arrange direct interviews uh, research about, you know, um, existing struggles, for example, struggles against the um, petroleum industry in, uh, in Nigeria. So, so that's the bulk of the book. And so the idea is that a lot of these struggles are already going on. So the, like the, the, you know, climate movement, it's not a new thing, but it's been newly repackaged in a way that actually invisibilizes or disempowers what I think are the most intelligent, the most inspiring, and, and the most deeply rooted uh, movements and struggles that have been going on all around the world. Um, so those struggles exist. Uh, the important thing is to encourage them, to spread awareness about them, to spread the models that they develop, uh, to help them get into touch, to, to create, you know, more, more global solidaristic relations, and, and then to use those models uh, uh, everywhere possible. And so I was also trying to tease out some of the, uh, some of the salient features, some of the, the most relevant practices that, that I think we see in a lot of those movements and practices, especially that allow solidarity, you know, beyond any one political party or political current uh, that allow solidarity um, across the globe, you know, between people speaking different languages and inhabiting, you know, different ecosystems and being faced with very different, um, different exploitative economies. Uh, also different, you know, different um, state contexts, like re whether you're in a more, uh, democratic state where the repression is, you know, using more soft tactics or whether you're in a, um, a state, you know, with frequent use of paramilitary violence, for example. And so despite those major differences, a lot of times we see that these, these movements that are using some of these characteristics, they're really able to understand each other and they're really able to, um, to build, sol build effective solidarity. 
Um, so then the, the final two chapters in the book are looking at uh, what, what those salient characteristics would mean uh, for like a stronger global movement and also what they would mean for uh, a transformation of, of world societies if, you know, as movements we're able to abolish capitalism and, and defy the power of the state and create societies that were actually designed to ensure the health and well-being of, of their members and to ensure the health and well-being of, of the land and the habitats that we, that we rely on for our survival. Um, so, so I criticize technocratic approaches in the book and um, parallel to that when talking about how to talk about the future, how to talk about proposals to the ecological crisis. I, I try to remain consistent and, and also criticize the practice of ideating a blueprint, which is meant to be globally valid and can be imposed you know, on the world as a whole. That brings up potentially uh, really interesting questions about intelligence, about organization, and about um, how institutions circumscribe uh, knowledge. So what is the advantage of the blueprint approach? Um, also, you know, for example, like Deleuze and Guattari have, have written about, you know, with like medieval stonemasons, like, you know, shift and different between different paradigms of knowledge, uh, between like a sort of a more situated building from within to like the, the blueprint approach where you can where you can abstract a plan and then impose it on the territory, which, you know, obviously is going to have uh, certain advantages, but it comes with it a much more authoritarian practice or an authoritarian relationship between the designer of the plan and those who execute the plan. And then, you know, often left out of the equation, the territory that the plan has to be imposed on. So that territory has to be flattened as much as possible so that it's not even an element. It's not even a player. And then the, you know, the blueprint is often, you know, funneled through various knowledge systems so that it can be made systematic so that those who implement the blueprint you know, can be increasingly like unskilled, exploited laborers who are following basically like systematic reproducible instructions. And then that concentrates all the power at the top uh, among those who are crafting the blueprint. On a wider social scale, uh, when it comes to things like, um, you know, climate change, we see the exact same thing that the sorts of solutions that require all of our activity and all of our uh, intelligence and knowledge of the territory from the territory, those are precluded from the get-go, whereas the kinds of, of supposed solutions that require the sort of uh, blueprinting authority that, that you know, imposes the plan on the territory, those are generally the only solutions that are, that are considered. So government agencies looking at a map and saying, okay, well, this rural area over here it doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, tourist, uh, tourist income. It's not very valuable territory. The, the farm fields there, they've all been farmed to death. And, you know, I mean, like a, a ridiculously high proportion of, of agricultural land globally has already been made infertile by, by industrial agriculture. So it's, it is kind of strange how few people nowadays are, like, recognizing that industrial agriculture is actually a failed system. It's not that it's, you know, it might fail in the future, but it's, it's already a failed system. So anyway, so we're looking at this territory that's already infertile. It doesn't have, it doesn't get a lot of tourism bucks. Let's fill it with, um, with wind turbines, for example, or let's see if there's any lithium to be mined there for batteries. So that, you know, that's a, that's a solution that's relying on the kind of statistical information that's available to, to government institutions. It's relying very much on um, there not being input from territories because if, you know, if every given territory were able to block a certain plan, there aren't many territories that would willingly, you know, surrender, surrender themselves over to lithium mining. Um, and it's a form of organization that doesn't, it's unable to have access to uh, specific and, and rooted intelligence. So pretty much like nowadays, pretty much everyone who's talking about like intelligent forms of organization, like computer scientists to, you know, biologists studying uh, fungal networks, pretty much everyone except within the political sciences acknowledges that, that decentralized systems with high connectivity are the most intelligent, that you don't get the most intelligent outcomes when uh, decision making is centralized within a smaller part of the overall social or, or ecological body. So um, yeah, the most intelligent computers are the ones that allow, you know, the highest uh, uh, level of, of communication between the components without it all having to go through central processing. 
Uh, it's you know been increasingly shown how um, entire ecosystems or specific organisms have have a high capacity for intelligence. You know when there's there's you know decentralized communication throughout the organism or, or throughout the body. So this is it's kind of you know it's it's sort of this disconnect within the sciences that in general everyone knows that decentralized networks uh, lead to the most intelligent outcomes, the best information sharing, and the best access to to knowledge. Especially, you know, if you're thinking about, for example, um, you know, like uh, whether, you know, whether it's sentient creatures or whether it's like sensors in, in a computer, like direct access to the local information. Uh, ants, ants, ant and bee colonies, for example, you know, uh, um, there's been, you know, interesting studies about decision making within within those groups and how it's based on, you know, uh, the individual, you know, worker ants and worker bees just constantly sharing information about like their own subjective take about uh, possible food shortages or, you know, uh, locations of, of, you know, food and other resources and so forth. So there's no one within the bee colony or the ant mound that has the bird's eye view. And in fact, it's, it's in their interest to stay out of the bird's eye view since the bird is the one eating them. Um, uh, and they, uh, they're able to make the most intelligent decisions on that basis with sort of a, you know, rooted, territorialized or, or subjective intelligence shared in a decentralized network. So basically, scientists across the board have, you know, are approaching pretty much a consensus around this model of intelligence, but it just does not at all penetrate into anything related to political sciences or anything related to how humans are supposed to make decisions, because we're supposed to make decisions uh, basically following the blueprints of um, elite institutions, academic uh, institutions, and, and government institutions. And that has a huge um, uh, corollary in the official solutions to, uh, to the ecological crisis, which tend to be solutions that actually just exacerbate ecological problems and they exacerbate uh, uh, social human problems. And they're often not that good even at dealing with, um, with climate change, but they're very good at maintaining these sort of hierarchical and institutional power relations. Uh, a great example of this is, is um, you know, carbon capture technologies. The primary, um, and, you know, this is, again, something that, like, you know, a, a small community, you know, we wouldn't really be able to use these, these technologies on our own. These te are technologies that only make sense at scale, and so they're going to be technologies that are, that are most available to the very, the very companies, uh, the very, you know, uh, organizers of economic activity that are, that are most to blame for the ecological crisis. It's become a new opportunity for them to, to profit, and the major use of those technologies, excuse me, has actually been to increase the um, increase the output of oil and gas wells. So they liquefy uh, carbon dioxide that's uh, extracted from the atmosphere, which you know should be bringing down um, um, uh, carbon levels in the atmosphere. Uh, but you know the, the what do they do with these gases? Where do they store them? Oh, well, oil and gas wells are a great place to store them. And, that, you know, we can use that to pump out more oil and gas. So that, that's just the perfect example of the supposed solutions that are, you know, coming from dominant institutions uh, and that constantly treat the territory with disrespect, uh, whether these are, you know, like poor and indigenous communities living in the territory uh, or whether it's, you know, non-human life, the land itself. And that, you know, that's not a coincidence that, you know, we're dealing with a crisis uh, in, in which, you know, other than human life and also, you know, humans other than, you know, middle and upper class um, Western societies are, are, you know, being threatened. Uh, and then, you know, the dominant institutions, the, the, the solutions that they're, that they're rolling out are all of them predicated on, on the very same disrespect, the very same extractivism uh, and, and exploitative tendencies. Um, so to kind of wrap that up, uh, how I talk about it in the end is, um, so for the past 15 years, I've lived in, in Catalonia, um, outside of Barcelona. And so I decided instead of to talk about, you know, what's the solution going to look like on a worldwide scale, but then also, you know, not to just, you know, look at like, you know, oh, well, you know, in our own little garden, we can, you know, um, you know, find the solution. I tried to um, sort of engage in an imaginary exercise that that has one foot in the global and one foot in the local and so i talk i imagine a process of a, of a couple decades with you know revolutionary movements that are able to able to abolish capitalism when it is you know in its its moment of you know a lot of a lot of crisis from um 
you know, just all of the, all of the contradictions that it produces. Uh, and what that would look like, you know, in the first few years, you know, when, you know, we're dealing with like the very real scarcity of, of, you know, transition from a system in which food comes from a supermarket, you know, and from halfway around the world to a situation in which we have food autonomy and, you know, we are doing, we're, we're providing for most of our food. Um, and then, you know, to like, you know, 20, 30 years down the road when there's, you know, been a lot more time to, to make those transitions and to live with abundance, you know, what abundance would look like uh, in a, you know, a, you know, completely anti-capitalist uh, society based on taking care of the commons, based on um, making empowered decisions about, you know, what technologies we want to transform and ad adapt uh, once we have, you know, the power to do that and what technologies, you know, we consider uh, just to be, to be harmful, what new technologies get developed. Um, and one of the considerations that I think is really, really important, especially you know, if we're if we're writing from the global north, in like the first few years, uh, how do we help? Uh, how do we help our comrades? And how do we help folks on the other side of the world, folks in in you know uh, colonized countries, folks in the global south? How do we help them survive that that transition? Because in Catalonia, which has you know access to a lot of industrial infrastructure, it'll be a lot easier for us than, for example, it will be for um, you know, uh, people living in Western Sahara or people living in Venezuela who are, you know, have these economies imposed on them that are, you know, just absolute dependence on the global economy, on these global processes. Um, so, uh, so for example, taking a cue from, well, early on in the pandemic, actually workers took the initiative in, in some automotive plants in Catalonia to repurpose their machinery to, to make respirators and things like that. So this is one of these great examples of worker self-organization early on in the pandemic being much more agile and certainly much more solidaristic, uh, helping you know, provide, provide these resources and helping move from, from scarcity to abundance when you know, there just weren't enough masks, weren't enough respirators and all the rest to go around. So taking a cue from that, I imagined, um, you know, these workers taking over factories, re, uh, repurposing them to not to, you know, produce like the, the consumer goods that, you know, people all over the world now are unfortunately dependent on, but to produce like simple machine parts that would allow, for example, folks in South America or folks in Northern Africa to move towards, uh, um, um, you know, self-reliance or, or to, move, uh, to move towards autonomy to be basically, for example, you know, I mean, a lot of these places are producing foodstuffs, but they don't even have the machinery to process their own foodstuffs. So for example, the, the simple machinery that would allow them to, uh, to carry out those processes and to not be vulnerable to starvation because they're dependent on this, um, this global network that only ever saw them as a colony. So, so for example, you know, and you have the port of Barcelona. So, so, you know, imagine like seizing, you know, these, these big, um, um, big ocean going cargo ships and and you know carrying out shipments to help other territories uh um you know achieve that achieve that self-reliance you know not in any kind of isolationist framework but within a global network of solidarity but one in which really like there i mean like in terms of like efficiency like basic efficiency there's no reason for you know populations to be getting the vast majority of their food from you know the other the other side of the planet so there are there are a lot of um uh transitions that i think need to be made uh, to move towards, you know, much more local, uh, uh, localized economies and, and self-sufficiency, but always within a global framework of, of communication, of solidarity, of sharing, and really the, um, um, the inspiration for that or the sort of seeds of that model are the kinds of international solidarity that already exist. Uh, they're the kinds of, of solidarity missions that already, you know, rise up when there's there's a movement that that you know suddenly gets stronger that that takes takes some space and it puts out a call for help from the rest of the world whether it's in you know chiapas and and oaxaca or kurdistan or or elsewhere so those kind of relationships they already exist as seeds for the kind of things that would need to happen um in you know at a, at a larger scale and in a more important way if if we do, if we are able to experience, you know, some kind of acceleration around both the collapse of capitalism and uh, the deployment of of our own strategies for for survival and and beyond for, beyond survival for uh, for life. Thank you, Peter. So everybody, if you have questions or comments, just write the word stack or use the raise hand feature that is available 
in the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screens. And I would, I'm waiting for one person to ask something before I ask anything. Well, so Peter, um, I found your presentation uh, covering these movements very encouraging. I, uh, the, the movements like uh, Christiana and Copenhagen and Zod in France and some of what you have described in Indonesia seems to me that we need as those who are in the broad anti-capitalist movement, whatever our orientation, we very much need to start having a, a, a not just a defensive organization and, and, you know, around, around the planet, but we need to be much more aware of these movements so that we can lend support. Um, mm -hmm. the, especially at moments when like, the Macron's government or whatever local um, uh, governmental authority did, decided to bulldoze the wonderful Zog community, or the Danish authorities took apart the the, uh, the Christiana network. It was very hard to get support networks together. Mm -hmm. and, and and what I what echoed through your presentation was. The, the, the infrastructure we need to make is much like, not that we all need to become permaculturists, but there is something from the permaculture movement that brings with, with uh, the science we learn about what we can do to transform our world into intense biodiversity with regionally biological viable uh, planting, treatments of the soil, bringing sunlight in, various things that I, I feel in some ways are very related, but on a micro level to what you're doing. And I, I do, I'm aware that there are some fissures in the permaculture movement with this or that, but there's fissures in, in every kind of movement we get going. <laughs> I, you know, the, the, the crazy sectarianism on the left, I see at some of some of the large uh, gatherings that we have for the environmental the ecological catastrophe often have sides that oppose one another and and some of there are some of our eco groups that I do feel aid and abet especially on the green capitalist side the furtherance of our decline not just our species but and, and I and, uh, parenthetically, what you're talking about is not just species decline, but one of the impactful parts of what you were explicating was where the growing number of dead zones, where life needs to be restituted in some way, where we as a collective, as a species, need to get to those areas like Northern Adriatic, I assume off the coast of New Orleans. Perhaps the entire New York Harbor will become dead or or, or unsupportive of life. And when we hear of things like the microplastics at the very depths of the Marianas Trench, it, it, as you said, the daily deaths from all of this hyperdevelopment and, and breaking of the metabolism on our planet are something we have to act on now. So um, do you have any idea of there being a global network that is developing I mean, you've done the interviews. Are the groups in these various countries, say Indonesia, Brazil, France, is there a, a vibrant communications um, solidarity network developing between these movements? And um, if so, how is that developing? Yeah. Uh, so there are... Um I would say that there are networks of communication and solidarity. Uh, I'm not sure if we could yet talk about like a network, but there are, there are an increasing number of, of uh, connections with an increasing amount of communication uh, happening. Um, and yeah, the fact that like, I've never been to Indonesia, I've never been to Brazil. The fact that I was able to, um, to interview with, with you know, like um, 
uh, you know, like long, like long distance, you know, telephone or email or whatever, uh, interview uh, people in those places is only thanks to, to those networks. So, you know, reaching out to, to other comrades, um, you know, also getting help with like the translations, you know, I could, I could do, you know, the, the Spanish uh, translations myself, of course, but like the, you know, Portuguese translations, uh, that was thanks to networks of solidarity that, that already exist. Um, how do those networks form? In, in large part, they form uh, out of necessity when there's a lot of repression or conversely, when all of a sudden a movement takes a big step forward and it, it you know, breaks new ground or it, it gets into territory that hadn't been before, it suddenly has a lot more capacities and it's excited about this, it wants to share, but it also needs help uh, you know, doing all the things that need to be done now. Like for example, if, you know, if you're going from you know, just being a, a group well, yeah, to pick a small example, you know, you're just a group that meets sometimes and then all of a sudden you, you squat a vacant lot and, you, you know, you manage to beat the city and it looks like for now the city's going to leave you alone and you can, you know, make a garden in that space. That's like a whole new capacity. You're going to be really excited about it. You're also going to need a lot more resources and knowledge and, and, you know, people to participate. So, you'll you know, you'll put out an invitation. And so similar things happened. The Zapatistas are a great example, or or the Kurds um, fighting, you know, particularly in in Rojava, um, and in those examples, you you have both you know the side of repression and the side of you know uh, breaking new ground or occupying new space uh, operating simultaneously. So those movements, you know, put out calls for for international solidarity, and you know to to a, a pretty decent extent they've they've gotten it, and so when you know, when people travel to places like that, they make new relationships. I really believe that, um, so first of all, you have to be interested. A lot, of, a lot of people, especially in the global north, you know, are very interested in like, you know, living in their little bubble or they're not that interested in, in things happening elsewhere. So there does have to be an impulse towards solidarity and towards global consciousness. But after that, I'd say the most important thing that, that is um, devalued a lot is, is like relationships. Solidarity is, is much stronger and more effective when it's based on real relationships. You mentioned fissures. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, conflicts in, in social movements. Sometimes these conflicts are really generative and healthy. Sometimes they're extremely destructive and movements end up destroying themselves. And very frequently, um, uh, repressive stat strategies by governments encourage and play up uh, those conflicts. Uh, with, you know, I mean, for example, COINTELPRO in the U.S. in the 70s being extremely effective at, at getting movements to, you know, to eat themselves, to destroy themselves. Um, so that's something people have to have to watch out for. When, when solidarity is based on, like, actual human relationships and, and high-quality relationships, then you have better access to, to knowledge because you have a better idea of what information you can trust. You have, uh, you know, stronger uh, motivations for solidarity and more effective solidarity because you know what, you know, folks in a different place actually need. Of course, no one person can have, you know, personal relationships with other people, in, you know, all over the world. We can't travel that much. And, you know, we're also limited in our emotional capacity of how many, how many people we can be friends with. But, um, I mean, if you look at it mathematically, like if in every, you know, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, for the most part in Europe and North America, we don't have real communities. Um, I think we're, we're too alienated to have actual communities. But in any, in any radical scene, you know, if, if just a, a, any radical scene has 10 to 20 people who, at, you know, at some point in their lives have, have done like an extensive solidarity trip to somewhere else in the world and, you know, spent, you know, enough time there to learn the language, to make friends, to understand, you know, the history and what's actually going on, then, you know, back in your scene, you know, you're like, if, if this is happening all over the world, then like, you know, mathematically, just like that, that network spans exponentially and you're going to be within two degrees of separation of someone on any continent, you know, anywhere else where, where there's some kind of, of popular struggle against, against capitalism. And that's, that's actually really, really potent. And I think that's, um, that's a strong basis for solidarity. Too often folks from the global north, uh, when we travel, we travel as, as tourists, even if it's revolutionary tourists. And we don't, we understand ourselves as individuals and not as part of, uh, not as part of collectives. So we don't tend to collectivize the context that we make and we don't tend to collectivize our experiences. And so that's one really important thing that we need to do. And the other thing I'd be really remiss uh, if I didn't mention the huge role that, that migrants play 
in building these international networks. And so that's largely from the global south to the global north. And these are these are folks who, who do often the most important work in creating that global solidarity and also spreading uh, global awareness of um, you know, problems and struggles around the world. So and so that you know also underlines the importance of of you know solidarity with with migrants and action against borders around the world. Thanks, Peter. David, you're on stack, and after you, David, is Michael Dola, and after Michael is Kate. So go ahead, David. I know you have to leave early, but yeah, I have to leave in a few. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, I was wondering how you imagine. Um, especially if you just take the case study of Catalonia where you're living now, how you would imagine a, a transition to the kind of society that you're taking place. That's the thing that often seems very difficult for me to understand because it would seem that it would re and of course this is true of, uh, of more traditional uh, Marxist uh, approaches to the idea of socialism too, but y y you could have a revolution in one place and that might change social relations in that one place. They still have to deal with the rest of the world that maybe that hasn't happened. And um, so you said places like Catalonia have an industrial infrastructure that they could put into use, but that industrial infrastructure has to get its raw materials from someplace else. So are they going to buy the raw materials or, I mean, you, could you see where I'm going with this? It, I, I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, and I may not be able to hear all of your answer, but because okay, I have to leave well, at five. But thank you. I'll try to be more anyway, concise than, than I've been so far. Um, so, so that's a really good question. I think uh, first off, it's important that we we re maintain a strong commitment to the idea of, of global revolution. That you know, the revolution in one country is not in the midterm going to be going to be possible. And so, of course, you know, early in the 20th century, at a certain point, there was a strategic uh, decision, you know, within the Communist Party to to opt for like a strategy of, of um, you know, socialism in one country. And and I think, you know, we can see in, in retrospect that that's that's you know not going to work, and it's going to subsume actually revolutionary practices to geopolitical considerations that are ultimately going to be identical, you know, no matter who's who's at the helm of, of a particular state. So. It, it will be uneven. I mean, obviously, you know, if there were a global revolution, it wouldn't, you know, happen all at the exact same moment around the world. Um, but we have seen, for example, that there are these sort of waves of, um, of revolutionary struggle that, that gets stronger in many countries at once, even when these countries are experiencing very, very different conditions. You know, like, what, like for example, you know, between, like, you know, 2008 to, uh, to 2012, 14, you know, uh, you saw these these huge upsurges in um, in resistance within countries that were experiencing economic growth, in countries that were experiencing total economic collapse. Um, you know, from from Turkey to to Brazil, really simultaneously. Uh, and and I think it would just be our responsibility to to push that further and to encourage that you know these processes become global as much as possible. As far as like the the more specific question you asked, like with with like the factories, like you know if workers were able to take over their factories, how would they get the raw materials? That's that's a really good question. Um, I think we can get some good examples um, to to kind of flesh out uh, a response to that with the experience of the. Um, the like the the worker worker managed factory movement in Argentina, who really had to deal with that question. Where that you know you had like dozens, uh, you know more than a hundred workplaces that were um, organized by the workers themselves, but they were doing that ultimately within a capitalist economy, uh, and and so they you know they they still had to deal with like questions like um, you know supplies and all that. And so on the one hand. I think it illustrates that logistically it's possible that, you know, they didn't, you know, in general, they, they weren't falling apart because they couldn't, um, because they couldn't provision themselves or because they couldn't organize themselves to, you know, to, to gain access to those resources. And then the, the, the limitations or failings of that movement underscore the importance of, um, you know, no peace with capitalism that, you know, these revolutionary movements, they need, they need to, spread throughout the world system or eventually they're going to stagnate and they're going to get reabsorbed into capitalism. So those, um, those self-organized workplaces, 
um, the workers' health organization, it wasn't, it wasn't a weakness. It wasn't a fatal flaw. They were, they were able to, to organize themselves. That wasn't a problem. And they were even able to organize themselves within and against the scarcities imposed by capitalism. And they were able mostly to maintain like enthusiasm, a sort of revolutionary enthusiasm of, of like, you know, believing in like a different way of, of, um, of, of living and organizing, you know, work and survival and all the rest for at least a few years. But over time, like that, that eventually gets sapped. And, you know, in the end, you get just like a, a sort of alternately organized capitalist, um, uh, capitalist economy or capitalist workplace. And you'll have a few exceptions that really, you know, manage to, to kind of stick to their principles for longer. Uh, so I think what that speaks to is that, you know, you'll have a certain window of opportunity to make a bigger transformation. Uh, but it's absolutely vital to push for that bigger transformation because there's no possibility for like a long lasting peace between capitalist and non-capitalist uh, ways of life. Michael Dola. Michael. Uh, thanks, Mike. Yes. Um, sorry, trying to take it all in and I'm a bit slow, so I apologize. <laughs> Um, thank you, Peter, so much for what sounds like an immense amount of uh, theoretical and ethnographic work around the world, uh, which is very impressive, and I'm very excited to hear about it. I um, was kind of, before knowing anything about your project, a bit, honestly, um, uh, dubious, I guess, based on the the title, like the solutions already exist, or at least the title for this talk. Um, you hear it kind of echoed in the same, um, you know, something like what Greta Thunberg, or however you pronounce her name, you know, the sort of more liberal progressive sectors who say, you know, the climate crisis has been solved. We, we have all the facts and solutions. We just need to wake up and change that kind of thing. Or, and I'm happy to hear you emphasize that this is not about, this is not a, a technical issue. It's not just about unleashing green technologies, um, but that all of social relations have to change. And it has to, you know, yeah, and not socialism in one country, all of those good things that we've learned from, you know, brutal lessons through history that still haunt us. So I, I really appreciate this. I'm very excited to take up uh, the book if I can um, and um, more generally, but um, I guess I'm asking maybe, you know, keeping in mind it's the Marxist education project, I think is the name of it. And, and that Marx did not say, you know, he famously was like that this is not about making uh, uh, recipes for the cookshops of the future, but there still is a universalism and, you know, dialectic with the particularities that we're talking about, right? The universalism being how do we abolish capitalism and, and capital because capital, the accumulation of capital is the primary problem of, you know, why the environment is degraded. It's, it's about unending accumulation of capital. Um, so if you don't have workers around the world talking about that, um, you can slip into, I don't know, you know, you probably know a lot more, but like Mondragon or co-ops are going to do it or somehow we're going to be able to insulate ourselves from um, socially necessary labor time and competition and all this stuff. So I guess my very long winded question is in your travels, how much are you seeing people like Marx take, being taken up? Not just because he's a great guy, but because he really got at from my reading the crux of the problem that we're faced with. Like, is he, is he, is he, is he dismissed as, you know, a crank that, uh, that was programmatic and vanguardist and all the rest of it that, that he's been saddled with. Thanks. Um, so uh, just to, yeah, to let you know, like in case you don't, like my, my background uh, that, I'm, that I'm writing from and like, you know, with my participation in social movements is, is as, as an anarchist, um, but also one, you know, with, with lots of friends and comrades who, who get, get a whole lot out of, out of uh, Marxist framework. Um, I would say that the, a lot of the things that I've seen like most, um, maybe most inspiring to people, like if we're talking about like theoretical frameworks, 
uh, have been uh, particularly a lot of um, a lot of anti-colonial writers coming from from different um, different contexts, whether it's like Franz Fanon uh, or you know also you know racialized uh, uh, writers, you know for example in the North American context. Uh, so like for a lot of people, I think it really clicks seeing. Um, seeing like the human dimension of this problem and, and, and like the, the historical dimension of it. Um, one thing I didn't talk about, which I do discuss in the book is, is like a critique of the, the Anthropocene, like the, um, the figure of the Anthropocene as in, you know, the, this is the current geological age, which is defined by, uh, you know, human economic activity. And, and that's, it's a well-meaning figure. You know, these are like scientists, these are geologists who are trying to, you know, say, hey, wake up everybody. You know, this is, this is a really big, serious problem. It's so huge that, you know, like a billion years from now, like the, this problem will be inscribed into, into like a layer of, of bedrock. Um, but it's also really problematic. I mean, it's an ultimately like a, a racist conceptualization, blaming a problem that's, you know, been around for, um, you know, a few hundred years on like, you know, the human species, which has been around for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And, and so really it's, it's, you know, using, using, you know, humanity as a stand in for, you know, like, you know, whatever humans are, you know, have been responsible for, for promoting and extending capitalism in the state. And, and so that like kind of being able to get that historical dimension to it, I think has been, um, like one of the theoretical perspectives that that seems to be like most current right now and, and most inspiring around the world. And that's, you know, those are theoretical currents that certainly have uh, inspiration in, in Marx in you know, Elisei Recluse or, or Kropotkin or other anarchist thinkers, uh, but have a lot more inspiration in uh, indigenous struggles uh, and like, you know, continuing, you know, present day indigenous practices, both of, of resistance and of, um, of you know ecosystemic uh, you know living in living in relation with uh, with with the land. Um, so so yeah, like you know, Marx is definitely still present, and and Marxist frameworks are are still being used. Um, but but I, I, yeah, I would say that like what really feels like you know for folks who are you know engaging with theory through reading, uh, I think like a lot of the stuff that um, that seems to be like really. Um, relevant nowadays is, is within like an explicitly anti-colonial framework. Kate, are you still here? I am. Thank you. Turn. Go ahead. Uh, Peter, let me reiterate uh, Michael's uh, enthusiasm about the range and variety of your approaches to this whole conversation and um, to the research that you did. Um, he also, Michael also mentioned the one word I haven't heard that much during your presentation, which is cooperatives. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more. I'm particularly interested in the, any cooperative movements that are happening in the rural context. Um, they, uh, despite Mike Davis's city of slums and, and, and the obvious a congregation of people moving out of the rural areas into the cities and into a uh, a more industrial context. I'm wondering if you are seeing the cooperative movement uh, active in in rural areas, but also um, any other comments you might have about specific cooperative efforts that that you have seen in in the research you've been doing thank you so much yeah um so uh, in catalonia where, where i live now there there are definitely a lot of rural co cooperatives some of them i would say like consciously align within a, a cooperative movement which definitely um you know could be said to exist um in, you know, they, like in, in, in Catalonia, like uh, also across, across Europe and other places and, you know, with connections with, you know, strong cooperative movements in, in Latin America. And then other, other cooperatives are, um, um, they, they use the cooperative forum as a tool without necessarily uh, holding up cooperatives as, as a sort of horizon. Uh, so, for example, more within within the anarchist movement, there there are also a lot of rural cooperatives that 
maybe have, have criticisms of the limitations of the cooperative form, but see it as like a very useful tool in the present context. And I mean, I should say like my relationship with those is not as a researcher, like I'm not uh, an academic, for example, it's, it's you know, as, as, a, as a participant. So uh, for example, um, on a much more informal level, we, you know, we engage in like all of our every year and other, other um, you know, activities around food production and in a collective way, uh, sharing, sharing like the food wealth that we create and, um, uh, and then, you know, trying to, trying to also, you know, enact like a more, a more collective relationship with the land. Oftentimes we're able to, uh, to squat uh, abandoned land or to take care of abandoned olive trees. Cause you know, the more that gets industrialized, if it's not on like a flat field then you know, they're likely to get abandoned. Um, and then to process the oil, you know, with, um, with, uh, you know, like smaller scale oil presses that are more solidaristic, you know, that have some you know, historical connection with the movement or that are run in a cooperative way. And, and so that's just, you know, kind of done like informally through, through affinities and done in connection with, you know, uh, you know, with other movements, other movement spaces. But then there's also, for example, um, La SIC, La Cooperativa Integral Catalana, so the, the Catalan uh, Integral uh, Collective. And that, you know, that could be said certainly to be, you know, to constitute like a, a sort of formal cooperative movement that I think puts a lot more emphasis on the cooperative form. Whereas, for example, within, within the anarchist movement in, in Catalonia, we're encouraging uh, the use of, you know, what we're considering sort of like anti-capitalist infrastructures. And, and, you know, we try to make like contextually appropriate decisions for, you know, what's the most effective organizational tool um, for this project or the other project, but then always linking it back into, um, a more explicitly anti-capitalist movement that also puts a lot of emphasis on attacking capitalist relations, attacking dominant institutions, uh, being in the streets uh, and stuff like that. And, and so actually it's, it's a much more quiet part of that movement, like the things that are like addressing collective survival. But, um, uh, you know, it's definitely, I mean, a lot of people are, like, I, I wonder also to what extent, um, the trend towards urbanization, you know, might even like boomerang back around in um, over the next decades. Uh, it seems to already be to be happening uh, uh, where I live and, and in some other places. And, you know, I think that would also certainly be consistent with uh, technological changes in, in capitalism more recently that enable decentralization, like decentralized productive activity to happen in a way that can still be controlled by, you know, by the owners of, of capital. Um, so that, you know, could, could be happening. But, you know, in any case, like a lot of, a lot of folks are like moving out of the city and, you know, finding places where they can live with, you know, like cheaper rent, less, less reliance on, on wage labor. And, um, and then also like, as, you know, as we get older questions like long-term care within movements, you know, against burnout, against the trauma of repression or just how we often like treat each other really poorly in movements or, or stuff like that. So a lot of these, um, a lot of the value I think in, in, in these in these projects that you know tend to be cooperatives or collectives or you know within that spectrum is is just how they allow us to like access abundance that's like outside of and against capital how they allow us to like take care of ourselves in a collective way that allows us to like survive past that like initial 10 years of like you know meetings meetings protests protests meetings meetings protests and and burnout so yeah um could i ask a follow-up question um i'm are you finding a difference in the sense of community? Because that's a key element in what you're, you've been talking about, is that those connections, those interpersonal connections that people are able to develop, are you finding a difference in the kinds of developments of that sense of community, either in, in the rural, rural context as opposed to the more city, urban industrial context? Is there is there more potential, say, in a I hate to say back to the land movement, but um, uh, or at least I hate to call it that, but still, um, is there more potential in that effort than there is in a um, rat race urban kind of lifestyle? Yeah. Um... Maybe like if, if you're looking at like very high rent cities uh, with, with fewer spaces, fewer neighborhoods that are kind of allowed to fall through the cracks. If anything, I would say that 
the divide I notice is not between rural and urban space, but it's, it's related to whiteness. Um, before I mentioned that I, like, I, I don't think that we actually typically have communities. I think it's like a, a word that um, gets misused a lot. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, one of, one of the main features of, of whiteness is, is just alienation, just constantly reproducing um, uh, social alienation in using the alienation now in a, in a way that, um, that Marx probably didn't, but um, uh, yeah, I think everyone probably understands what I'm saying. Um, and so like one of the problems with like back to the land movements, if, you know, if, if thinking in a European context, not even thinking about all the you know, problems that they can run into and in, like, you know, in like a settler state in North America. Um, I think a lot of the times people confuse affinity with community. Uh, like right now I live in a neighborhood. It's like a very low income neighborhood. It's like a few apartment uh, blocks that are kind of like a bit marginalized and set aside. Half of the apartments are squatted. The other, the other half are rented. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of like undocumented people, a lot of single moms, a lot of, um, I mean, you know, everyone, everyone in the neighborhood is, is, is low income. And, at times when the neighborhood has been threatened because the, the city government would love to just like bulldoze the entire neighborhood at times when it's been threatened, like we've had like a very vibrant neighborhood assembly that comes up that, that resists that, you know, creates a sense of cohesion that does fundraisers, that does protests and, and that, you know, blocks the city's plans to, to screw us over somehow. Um, but in reality, like most of the people, like the people in the neighborhood, like really hate, like a lot of other people in the neighborhood, there's, there's no affinity. There's a lot of bad blood. Um, but, but we come together when, you know, like the whole is threatened. We could certainly benefit from having like good conflict resolution mechanisms and like, you know, ways of like dealing with like drug mafias and, and stuff like that. You know, we don't have those. We'd be much stronger with it. But I think that comes much closer to being an actual community than, sort of back to the land group of like, you know, 10 friends who, you know, are, you know, all think the same way. Um, I think community should be defined on the basis of mutual survival uh, and not like, um, like, you know, if you actually like depend on uh, other people there for your survival. And like lately with friends, I've been joking, like, you know, it's, it's not a community unless you hate some of the other people that live there. But despite that, you still stay there because the typical story of like, you know, the back to the land, project is you know once you get a conflict like you know people went there thinking that they're going to be you know super besties with you know best friends with with everyone and everything was going to be you know perfect and hunky-dory and the ties that bind them together are not strong enough to outlast a conflict so when there's a conflict someone has to leave and then eventually the whole thing falls apart until it's just like you know two or three people living there they're you know in, <laughs> one person who's in perfect agreement with himself and so there's no more conflict um it's not a community unless there's, you know, stronger ties that bind people together for better and for worse. Cause you know, <laughs> being bound to a, uh, to a group of people or to a, a location isn't always, isn't always pretty. Michael Dolo, you're uh, there, but before you, Michael, is there anyone who has not asked a question or made a comment who would like to go ahead, Michael. Thanks again, Michael. Uh, yeah, who, was it Sartre or Camus who said hell is other people? Uh, but I, I, it's really, really important that new, that that part of it. So I'm glad uh, you talked about that. Um, yeah, building our yeah building our abilities to like problem solve within movements and criticize within movements in principled ways. Um, without it dissolving, right? Um, something that, like, I wish Occupy Wall Street had um, obviously continued on in other forms. Everybody does once the occupation was, um, the encampments were, you know, swept up. Um, but there was also, yeah, the kind of, like, inability to form longer-term organizations out of that. And, and that, I think that's a big part of it was that it's just kind of, like, interpersonal issues and 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 that plagues movements you know up until today and 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 prior to occupy obviously but um not to go too far on a tangent you um made you did make me think about the line you know when we were talking about all of um the uh the sort of like defensive campaigns like let's stop uh, the airport from being built. Let's stop uh, 
this uh, parcel of land from being developed or, you know, that is so, um, they're so necessary, those struggles, obviously, but they're also very um, vulnerable, right? That it just is a reflection of us being on our heels in a lot of ways um, and makes me think of the line that, um, so that the IRA or something said about the, um, the British like police or uh, intelligence services, like you have to be lucky all the time. We only have to be lucky once. Mm. Um, and, and I tell you, losing a local struggle to like keep a wetland, which is now completely like was all of the, the acres of trees. This is on Staten Island, Michael, um, were raised to the ground is really depressing and, and very like demobilizing and you have to gather up yourself. Um, but um yeah, that kind of uh, sort of struck me. Um, I did notice that you had um, some critical things to say about the liberal, more liberal groups relation to um, violence, nonviolence, which is also a relation to whiteness, uh, to bring up a, back a term that you were talking about um, in terms of community. So can you talk a little bit about um, what you think of as like self-defense and what is needed in terms of like a broad reorientation. Um, it seems to me to be an intimately connected to whether or not you think like a revolution is ne necessary. Mm -hmm. Sorry for this uh, j again, jumble of thoughts, but very generative. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely uh, critical of nonviolence and uh, particularly groups like Extinction Rebellion that came on the scene with sort of um, trying to deploy another iteration of like this kind of color revolution uh, approach, which, which I think we can, you know, that's like that the case has been definitively made about how those color revolutions are uh, like necessarily based on like a superficial model of social change, uh, mobilizing the media around empty slogans and, you know, trying to get enough support either to create a political crisis or to win an election or something like that. And, um, you know, this is, this is a method that was based on Gene Sharp's work that, that ultimately just becomes like the most um, superficial uh, form of nonviolence that exists. It's definitely the dominant form that exists today. And it's one that's connected only to social change that is completely compatible with, um, with the interests of uh, you know, the dominant layers of society or dominant institutions. In fact, it came out that, um, you know, one of the main groups promoting the sort of color revolution models, you know, was actually working with, um, with US intelligence. And, and so like an emphasis on nonviolence is very, is very critical to that because it prevents movements from getting out of control. It makes it easier for movements to be packaged for the media and so on and so forth. Um, I think self-defense is, is uh, an important value, an important practice, especially if we understand it in collective terms rather than individual ones. I also don't think that it should be like a limit to our movements. I, I don't think there's, um, there's anything wrong with, with attacking uh, a system that, that is just um, so, um, so destructive to, you know, to, to life and, and happiness and, and freedom and the ecology and all the rest. Um, so, um, as an anarchist that, you know, it's no surprise that, that I'm, you know, critical of a, um, of a, um, separation between means and ends. Uh, but that's because I think that, um, that it's not just an ethical question, but that at, like the means that you use are always going to be reflected in, in the ends that you create. Uh, and so I, um, I think it is important in, social movements that aspire to be revolutionary to have, you know, some kind of question, not just about the, the efficacy of tactics, but, um, you know, if you, whether you prefer to look at it as like, you know, the ethics of those tactics or whether you prefer to think about it as like the, you know, being realistic about the kinds of social relations that you would actually produce uh, through using certain methodologies of struggle. Uh, I think that's really important. I think that can, be done that can't really be done effectively using the the criterion of violence since violence is it's such an imprecise term it's um you know it's kind of morally coded it's it's extremely contextual no two groups of people have the same definition of of what constitutes violence i think looking at um how authoritarian tactics are is really important 
uh, whether, you know, whether a tactic is, um, is, you know, spreading, spreading power throughout society, throughout the lower classes to organize their own lives, or whether, uh, whether a methodology of struggle is, is limiting that. So, for example, when you look at uh, Fanon's discuss discussion of violence, uh, you know, he obviously has no, no rejection of armed struggle against colonialism, but he looks at this common dynamic of parties that will make an initial foray into armed struggle and then ultimately move towards more pacifying methodologies because they don't want to lose control of their struggle and they want to demonstrate to the colonizer that they can be responsible governors, that they can be a new governing class and they can be trusted with control of the colony. They can be, you know, you can, the colonizers can hand over control of their project to this supposedly anti-colonial force. And, and so it is really interesting how violence and then nonviolence comes in to that, um, that that an analysis that Fanon makes, um, so I would I would look at at that and and you know kind of take that take that approach and go even further with it to look at you know whether uh, whether a method of struggle is is compatible with you know broad self organization across the society or whether it's trying to you know limit the tools of struggle you know within the hands of a party or within you know the hands of um, of you know a more a more uh, elite group that can be institutionally controlled, and and if we want to talk about ethics, like I would say that you know there's a huge problem. Uh, sorry, there's a huge difference between um, uh, like say like you know in um, a U.S. city, someone in the present context, the present environment, uh, you know, killing a cop, given the kinds of things that you know police are doing you know every every day of the year. There's, you know, a huge difference between that, between um, imagining some revolution, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, where the police, you know, in the city have already been defeated, and then going around and like arresting everyone who had previously worked as a cop, uh, and then killing them. Uh, so, you know, like in, in both cases, like, you know, like we're, we're dealing with like, you know, another human being is getting killed. In one of them, they're being killed by someone who has very little power and is, is you know, in, in the situation of having much less power. In the other situation, it's, you know, sort of like this, like, determination that, you know, this, you know, from the group that at that point has all the social power deciding, well, you no longer deserve to live. And I think that those are very, very different, um, different activities and the kind of social relations that they could potentially, they could potentially produce. Um, but yeah, so it's a you know, rather bloody example, but um, you know, hopefully you know, one that makes sense. So one of the things that happens uh, with me when I'm trying to promote an event like your book, Peter, I look at your, what I can get from Pluto. And I was very struck by you bringing up, there are people in the Amazon, one of our most biodiverse parts of the planet that is being systematically exploited, burned, we have, I don't think we understand the level of destruction there. And also the entire Indonesian um, set of islands. I don't know. There must be 14,000. I don't, I don't, I'm not Wikipedia. I don't know how many islands, but there's a tremendous number of islands. And, and then just Googling images about what your book is about, the, my screen was like a forever screen. There is so much activity. I was truly uh, astonished. Unfortunately, Corbus and uh, Getty, they own too many of the images and I'm afraid of you. There are some great images and I grabbed a few that I think are not copyright protected. We've, we've been attacked for taking copyright images. Mm. But what struck me most about the images I saw from Indonesia is that they're in the context of a country where the U.S. colluded with the fascists more than 50 years ago and had a, a thoroughgoing extermination of anyone on the left. They didn't care where you were or even if you were sympathetic or not critical enough, you could be taken out of your house and murdered. And I think that the U.S., was responsible with the Indonesians uh, for a half million people dying in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Yet, in the past year, 
unlike anyone expected, workers at factories all over Indonesia went out on this huge general strike that was not just a symbolic general strike, but was a, a real demand going on. And, and, and then when I saw the images related to countering the palm oil plantations, I, I, I started wondering, is the consciousness of those people, the indigenous in the rural areas, protecting the rich biodiversity, is their consciousness becoming part of the working class consciousness in the towns? Is, is there, I mean, I'm trying to build connections that may or may not be there, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any idea if that is developing there, or I, I'm sure in Brazil, the workers' movements are in some ways uh, tied in with the indigenous movements to protect the Amazon. In fact, I've seen evidence of that. But um, I'm going on too much. It would be great to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, well, the, the comrade that I interviewed in Indonesia is um, a Dayak anarchist uh, who uh, lives in the city, grew up mostly in the city. So he is, he, he is indigenous, but he didn't grow up in, uh, in the rural communities in, in Kalimantan, in, in Borneo. Uh, which is like the largest uh, largest island, um, and so he's he's like uh, I guess one of these folks that you could also kind of look at as like you know um, having crossed borders and so has like a, like a foot in in multiple worlds. So he has you know he has relatives, he has uh, like the the close contacts in um, in Dayak uh, communities uh, in the highlands that are you know fighting to protect the forest and protect their gardens against uh, the palm oil plantations and and that are still dealing with you know the remnants of that um state violence that uh that you know the united states and and indonesian governments unleashed during the cold war um and he also has uh you know connection with uh urban anti-capitalist movements um so so yeah so there's there are definitely like like, you know, it, it ends up happening, you know, these very human ways of like, you know, people who have like a foot in, in two different worlds and can kind of serve as, as conduits for that. So that's um, like never having been to Indonesia, I couldn't, I you know, yeah, yeah, won't, yeah. won't offer more, but like that's, you know, the one person that I, or I talked with several people in order to get in touch with, with this one comrade. But um, yeah, the, the person I interviewed for the book is, is a perfect example of that. Great. Um, Michael, you typed something here. Oh. Well, yeah, that that's an idea. Uh, anyone who has not spoken yet who would like to ask a question, or Kate, uh, do you have anything more to comment on? Well, I do want to make sure that everyone knows the book is available. And if you go to Pluto's website and put in the letters MEP, you will get a discount. I don't know if that cuts into your royalties, Peter. Or in, oh. I know that your royalties do not go to you. They go to, <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't, at the same time, I incur, a lot of lefties now steal books or bootleg them from uh, you know, various sites. But I, I do feel left publishers need to be able to survive. So I, I encourage people to buy books in one way or the other, rather than bootleg them. Uh, in this pandemic, it's not necessarily easy for many working class people to buy books, but we cannot support the spread of these ideas unless we support authors like you or the causes that you're supporting through your yeah. writing. Like, like you mentioned, in this case, all the, all the royalties from, uh, from the book go to projects that participated with interviews in Brazil and in Indonesia. That's great. That's really great. Um, we, need to, we need to fundraise for in, info shops to keep the, the left publishing industry uh, alive. Yes. Claire? Hey, um, Peter, my name is Claire. I live in Ithaca in Cayuga land and I'm a friend of your mother. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, Claire. Okay. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> nice to meet you. And uh, there was so much that you offered and thanks to Michael for uh, 
holding this space for this kind of conversation and sharing. And uh, I'm not literate in a lot of Marxist stuff, but I um, relate to many of the principles. And um, really, I liked the for better or for worse part, because like wherever you are, wherever you're living, if you don't have relationship with your neighbors for 30 years or whatever, where you like sometimes have collect, anyway, I'm not gonna, I don't have a prepared remark, but I just could really relate to that part. I grew up in the Bronx and I think we were all like first gen or second generation from another place where there was community. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, in this place where I'm living now, it's hard to find that organically. Um, but I live on the west side of town where it happens um, with some intentionality. Uh, I, yeah, I guess the, that piece of anti-colonialism really speaks to me. And um, where I live, the Cayugas are returning and that is complex. And also that's a very, the, the Haudenosaunee, um, the way of peace is that we respect or try to respect in those relationships is very slow. And even when there's this really big belligerent guy that uses weapons and um, the clan mother just employed her 85 pounds of nonviolent resistance with the guy um, and nothing was forced even between, anyway. Um, so there's a lot to learn from the first nations people where we are living um, to go forward on this planet in more proper relationship or right relationship. Um, but anyway, thanks for putting so much into it and bringing us all the way to Catalan. <laughs> um, just a tiny little thing to add that's popping up. There's a friend here who wrote a book about struggles on the west coast of Ireland, where my grandparents are from, um, that experienced the death threats and the imprisonment and the whole thing that even happening in what you might call a first world setting uh, with the indigenous fishermen or whatever, that that same thing is happening even in places like that. Um, and then in places like Vieques, uh, where there was that successful thing, but even, even if it was short lived because then the corporate buying of that seafront on that beautiful island, Isla Nena. Um, there's something to that and like Standing Rock and places where the struggles may not seem to have been effective or rather successful, that's the word I mean, that never to discount the value of tasting something for so many people and just being, I wasn't trying to go to Standing Rock uh, myself, but I was kind of pushed into it. And then the Red Warrior Collective asked for people who did certain things, church people, whatever. So I ended up going there twice, but I was struck the first time like, oh, this is a sort of decolonized space. Everybody is fed. Everybody is given a place to sleep. Everybody is uh, encouraged to respect the sort of agreement of how you be there. Um, Anyway, just putting, and also I was quite taken by the power of symbolic action there, that it wasn't all about the efficiency action, but that there was um, reverence for the sacred action of symbolic. And that is something I'd like to reclaim for all people. Because <laughs> um, quantifying things in the whiteness Western mind is a deadly thing. It's come something to decolonize ourselves from. And these relationships with our with the creator and creation, um, yeah, even though I appreciate scientists, it's part of what's uh, killing us, I think, to narrow it down into this measurement or think we know everything. Um, and I guess maybe just listening, and I have all these pages of notes, is that, I know very little actually, but I'm so glad to listen and thanks for putting the energy in. And thanks for Michael hosting. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone who came today. Uh, and I, I, I re remember now, the other thing about you, Peter, is you, did you help A.K. Thompson with Keywords for Radicals? Um, I, I wouldn't say that I helped. I, I wrote an entry. Um, so I, I have an entry in, in A.K. Thompson's book. Oh, yeah. what, what, what entry? What word? Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, even if you did it. If I'm not remembering incorrectly, uh, it's been a while since I looked back. I think on violence, I think. Ah, Okay, I have a copy somewhere in the, my morass of books here. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here. And again, Peter, thank you for putting the time into putting this book together and doing these interviews and making it available to everyone in the world.